All right, my name is Carly Stoughton. I am a technical marketing engineer with the NCMA Business Unit, which is responsible for ACI, Nexus 9K, and the Nexus 3000 as well. Um, and we, I will be talking about today a little bit about how devices connect to the fabric. How are we actually connecting what we have in our network today? All of our different hypervisors, bare metal servers, routers, everything we have out there today. So we're going to look at the different domains, which is how we define these different devices that we have on the network. And that's one slide, no more. The rest is whiteboard. <coughs> All right, so what we're going to start with, I have a, my spine leaf topology. I have my controllers, again, which is a cluster of three. Three controllers. All devices are connected to the leaves. Leaves only connect to spines. Leaves don't connect to each other. Spines don't connect to each other. So I have my standard uh, spine leaf topology, predictable latency, every device three hops away from one another across the fabric. First thing what we're going to look at is VMware integration, what we call a VMM domain or a virtual, uh, a virtual machine manager. So one way that we can get devices into different endpoint groups is by integrating into our VMware servers. This is actually going to give us a lot of visibility into what's going on inside of the VMware servers. It's optional. You don't have to do this with your VMware servers. Uh, but what we have here is I've got an ESXi server that's running, say, a web VM, and I've got a database VM on there. So we'll say in my controller I've already defined an application profile. So maybe my application profile, I've created a web EPG. And I've created a database EPG. Again, that was all from the controller. So the cool thing that we can do is we can actually, from the controller, we can push a VMware distributed switch into these VMware servers. And by pushing that switch in, each port group can act as an endpoint group. So instead of do, defining EPGs by things like VLANs or VXLAN tag or physical port, I can do it based on virtual port. So the way this works is I will, from my APIC, set up a relationship between vCenter So I'll essentially point to the IP address credentials of vCenter server uh, used for my uh, VMware management. Um, and this creates what's called the VMM domain, the Virtual Machine Manager domain. And I'll have one of these per data center. So in VMware, uh, we've got vCenter. And underneath that, we have data centers. Right, VMware construct that VMware admins use to provide isolation between servers and virtual machines. Between the eight, our controller and vCenter server, uh, it's one VMM domain per data center. So I, if I wanted to have integration, I would create two separate VMM domains, one for the East Data Center, one for the West Data Center. So that allows you to deploy this in pilot environment while the production VMware environment is untouched. Right. 
because cool. it's on a per data center basis. Yep. So one Cisco VMM domain per one VMware data center. VMware being the data center object, Cisco being the, uh, or VMM being the Cisco object. So with this integration, uh, once I have set up this relationship, under my endpoint groups, what I can do is I essentially say, I add that VMM domain Let's say this server belongs to data center east, so maybe I've called this east. I add that as one of the criteria for that endpoint group. That's one way that I'm gonna sort things into that endpoint group. I could do the same thing for, um, for my web. Uh, Once I do sorry. that, a minor question. detail, uh, I think you skipped a step, at least for me. So when you connect APIC with the vCenter server, mm -hmm. and you have to push the distributed switch into ESX servers, mm -hmm. is that your AVS switch or is that something else? It can be either. So you could push, you actually choose when you're doing the integration whether you want it to be the AVS or if you want it to be a VMware distributed switch. Ah, so you also work with the standard distributed switch. Mm -hmm. Nice. Distributed switch, not yeah. not standard yeah. Yeah, switch. Yeah yeah, 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 you know the difference. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but the yeah the virtual distributed switch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's nice. But yeah, you can choose it. It doesn't have to be AVS. It could be regular distributed switch. So, what that's going to do for us once I tie. So I've created this, these EPGs. I tie this what's called a domain in here. Um, the VM admin then needs to connect the. NIC to the distributed switch. So this could be the AVS, or it could be what I like to call the APIC created VMware distributed switch. But it's a V switch that gets pushed in there. Now it's up to the VMware admins to go ahead and connect an uplink, right? That's their job. Um, but what they're gonna see is they're gonna see new port groups pop up that line up to these EPGs. So they're gonna see one called web, port group called web, and they're gonna see a port group called database. And then it's up to them to go ahead and connect the VNIC to those port groups. That's still the, the VMware admin's responsibilities. But the port groups are created from APIC out. Yes, the APIC pushes the port groups, mm -hmm. absolutely. So we get that level of control where we have the network folks responsible for the network things. VMware guys, all they're doing is connecting VMs to port groups. So it gives us that nice line in the sand of who's responsible for what. So I'm guessing that these port groups are read-only in vCenter. Uh, no, and that is because of the VMware API. So we're actually pushing in the distributed switch. If it's the, stand, if it's the VMware version of the distributed switch, that's going in through their API. Mm -hmm. So that's how they create it, so we can't touch it. AVS, different story. That's more like the Nexus 1000B, where we have control over that. So in a, um, let's say I've got a UCS environment mm -hmm. that I'm rolling into ACI. So I've got multiple Cisco options now on how I address VMs, right? You can do VM effects through, the, through UCS. You've got the ability to use the AVS to associate those VMs directly with ACI. What's, this, what's the best design solution there? So it's, it's going to depend on your existing environment and on the application. Okay. Right? If you're doing VMFX, then you're probably not going to be doing this integration. Okay. Because you're tying that directly to 
those virtual NICs. So. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. But absolutely, I haven't drawn UCS up here, but of course UCS could be sitting out here connected to the leaf also. And notice I also have switches in between. Right? It doesn't have to be directly connected to my leaves. I can have all my other switches out here. So, yeah. But the VMM integration, and then anytime, say, I, uh, my VMware admin spins up 10 new web servers, once he connects those to that web port group, they're going to show up in the controller, and I'm going to see that, and the policy is going to be enforced. So I don't have to go make any changes. So a very so, elegant way to do the endpoint groups. So how do you identify those VMs being in those port groups when the traffic comes into the leaf? Do you enforce different VLANs for different port groups, or do you do that by, based on MAC address of the VM? The port groups do have VLANs. Hmm? Um, one thing you do when you set up any domain is you create a VLAN pool. Okay. So you'll have a VLAN pool that also gets pushed out to the server, mm -hmm. and each port group will have a different VLAN that's assigned to it. Okay, questions on the VMM domain, number one. Pretty cool way to, to do endpoint groups. It's a nice, nice way to set that up uh, if we have VMware servers. Uh, it's also coming for Microsoft Hyper-V integration. Right now, VMware. So how else? Let's say I've got other servers out there, right? We're not 100% virtualized. We're not 100% VMware. Right, that's just not the case these days. So option number two and three are similar. Um, let's start with the second one, uh, external physical. Um, maybe I've got some bare metal database servers. Right? Some applications simply aren't designed to be virtualized and actually run better on bare metal. So I've got these bare metal database servers out here. Now, they're still database servers. So ideally, I want to put them in the same endpoint group. Right? Why would I create a different EPG? The whole point of these endpoint groups is that I lump together the things that I want to have similar policy, similar treatment. So the nice thing that I can do is I can create a physical domain, and I can tie it to this database EPG. And essentially what I'm saying is anything that comes in on this leaf, we'll say this is leaf 101, anything that comes in on leaf 101 on port 1 slash 2, let's say these guys are in VLAN 10, anything that comes in there tagged with VLAN 10, put it in the database EPG. And that could be completely separate from this, right? They're both database servers, but I could actually put them into the same database group or hypervisor agnostic, right? Could be bare metal servers, could be Hyper-V, could be Microsoft or um, VMware. Put it in the and same. To be clear, the EPG is wholly independent from like the IP subnet, right? Right. So you could have two different devices in two different IP subnets in the same endpoint group, yep. and likewise you can have devices in the same IP subnet in distinct endpoint groups that would need policy to be, to be yep. able to reach each other, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, because it's all based on contracts. Yeah. We're not looking at, I mean, we're trying to, again, we're changing the way we're thinking about networking, and we're kind of trying to decouple the way that we just think about VLANs and subnets is how we forward traffic. Now it's about policy and those contracts. I have a... Yeah. Real Related, go ahead. Go ahead. So I have a related question. So one of the things that's been our concern is as we start to craft our, our uh, policy, really, the, um, the number of EPGs and contracts between them and the, how granular you get is a, is a significant, there's a, there's a sliding scale there. You can get extremely granular mm -hmm. or you can be very broad, right? Right. And we're, we're having a hard time figuring out how to define that policy properly in that, in that sliding scale of granularity. Uh, versus, you know, broad. 
So have you guys yet, I mean, do you have any good use cases yet? I, I haven't seen any case studies just yet about how people are crafting their policies to find the best mix of that. Is there, has there been anything done to, to really to focus on that aspect of it to keep that? Because, I mean, the policy explosion could be immense and it could add to a lot right. of complexity, like firewalls and things that we've seen in the past. Right. So we, we are working on collateral to show common use cases. Um, Cisco IT is, you know, was one of our pre-FCS, one of our first customers, and we're uh, working on CVDs and white papers to show real-world examples of how that works. Yes. So keep on the lookout. Is that that? Yes. And we have a couple books that were recently published, um, one on troubleshooting and one on kind of ACI overview. Um, both of those are available today, um, and I believe those also have some examples and best practices. So that would be the best place to start with those. Yeah, I, books. I may need to see what the newest material you've published. I probably haven't looked okay. at the books, so I'll take a look at those. Okay. Books. <coughs> so that is another way that we can sort things into these buckets that we call endpoint groups. Nice way with the physical domain. Again, database server, database server, just because they're running on two different types of platforms, I want to treat them the same, so I want to put them in the same EPG. So I could do that for my bare metal. And I could have other devices connected here too. All right, maybe I've got some stuff in VLAN 20. I could set that up on the same port. All right, I haven't just blown that port. Right, I can say anything also that comes in on that same port that's tagged with VLAN 20, put that into a different EPG. Now, I totally agree with what you said before that, you know, let's stop thinking about VLANs, start thinking about, or subnets, start thinking about the contracts and so on. But effectively, the IP traffic still has to go between IP address A and B. And if they happen to be in a different subnet according to the subnet masks, someone has to do that. So I guess that's what you do in the ACI with the Anycast uh, gateway, right? Right. So the fabric is what will actually do the forwarding. But yes, we do have the Anycast gateway. Um, so it's kind of like having an HSRP group on all of the leaves, except all of the uh, default gateways are active. It's not HSRP. It's an Anycast gateway. But that way, if I have a VM move from one leaf to another, it's not going to have to go hairpin the traffic to hit its default gateway. Yeah, absolutely. Which also means that you sort of set up VRFs based on the EPGs and contracts, right? Yes. Yes, we do have the concept. We call them private networks, but essentially it's a VRF. Uh, that's how we isolate traffic and how we isolate tenants and make sure that there's separation inside of the fabric, yep. So the IP subnets really become kind of secondary. Yeah, exactly. Now how do you handle broadcasts within a subnet then, right? So if a host does an all, sub, you know, an all host broadcast within the subnet, does that only go to members of that endpoint group? Does it go to, like, how does that get? So ideally, we don't want to flood on the fabric. So for something like uh, an ARP request, yeah. uh, say we've got a server that has an ARP request. Um, since we know where everything is in the fabric, right, the spines know where everything is, there's no reason for us to flood that across the fabric. Okay. So when that ARP request comes in, we're actually going to turn that into a unicast across the fabric. And then when it comes out, it'll go where it needs to go. Oh, uh, OK. So we want to eliminate flooding on the fabric. How about for all my NetBIOS traffic? For NetBIOS? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, OK. <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about the Apple Doc? Um, but you can you can change if you have applications that do require flooding. Mm -hmm. That's something that you can change. But but then would that flood within the EPG or would that flood subnet wide? So that floods within that would be within what's called a bridge domain. Uh, that's okay. one of the objects that we have, um, which is essentially a collection of subnets. That's what creates the default gateways, okay. and the bridge domains are where you define the flooding behavior. Okay. So, so I made a joke on Twitter that now we can go back to slash 16s in all the data center, but that's probably not actually a good idea. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, sure, <laughs> you could. <laughs> go for it. There we go, Cisco validated design. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, great. I said it. <laughs> All right. So that is the physical domain. Um, external layer two, similar concept. We're saying anything that comes into, let's say this is leaf 102, anything that comes into port one slash seven that's tagged with, say, I've got my, maybe I've got some Minecraft servers down here. Really important. Yes. Really important yes. application. Ask my Funny kids. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got some uh, Minecraft servers. So anything that comes in here, tagged with VLAN 20, put it in my Minecraft EPG. So I would have to create a Minecraft EPG. Um, the difference is with the physical, I don't have to create another EPG. Right? I could just add this physical domain to an existing one. With external L2, this actually creates a new Minecraft external L2 EPG. So when you say it creates or we create or is that because I'm I'm may not, probably the only one I'm struggling to understand the difference between the two and it's so on once on the the, the physical domain, we opted to put that stuff in a particular EPG. Right. And then on this, it sounds like we're opting to just create a new EPG. Right. I, I, I'm not seeing the difference. Am I, am I alone in so, this? Yeah. No, oh, and oh. I, I, I agree with you. They are very similar. Um, and it's part of it is a design choice. And the way that we recommend using these is the physical is usually for things like bare metal servers. External L2 is usually for, say, connecting to my campus switches or the rest of my network, where I'm going to have a lot of stuff coming in here. So uh, is the distinction that we're not mixing and matching with VMM domains as well? Is that, is, you know, some of your Minecraft example here, that's just going to be used that, for that. We're not also putting in stuff from VMware and into the same EPG. Um, it, you could, uh, well actually with this one, no, this would be a separate domain. So this would be its own, its own separate entity. You would still need to create a contract if you wanted your users to play Minecraft. You'd have to create a contract between this and your user EPG. But yes, this, this is its own <coughs> entity that you'd set up. And again, typically this is for connecting to your other existing data center switches, your 7K, whatever you might have. This is usually what we do for bare metal servers. Okay. So would, exter would you have multiple external EPGs on that port for different VLANs or? Sure. Would okay. Yeah. Most likely you would because if this is say going to our data center switch, I probably have a lot of traffic, a lot of different VLANs that I'm trunking. There. Well, now I really can't see the difference between the two. Okay. <laughs> Great. So that's another way that we can sort things into EPGs. Uh, last one is we're probably going to have some layer three connectivity, connect to an external, maybe a WAN or internet router. Um, so the way that we can do that is uh, what's called an external layer three domain. So we will actually create a peering relationship between our router and our leaf. Um, and right now, the protocols that you can do that with between these guys are OSPF, V2, <laughs> static, and IBGP. So I, I've heard that EIGRP has been opened up now. Have you considered doing that? It's co yeah, <laughs> it's coming. Yeah, and it's surprising because that's the Cisco protocol, right? It's all open, open. Mostly open. Yeah, yeah mostly. <laughs> What's not open about it? Stub areas Stubs. are not in there. You kept some little nuggets for yourself. I'm just saying. Okay. So transit is transit is coming too. Yeah. Now, now that you wrote OSPF v2 there, I have to ask the question: Does this support IPv6? That's also coming. <laughs> it's on the roadmap, okay. Yeah. And since he asked that question, I'm going to ask my favorite question. You want to plug in? <laughs> since he asked that question, I'm going to ask my favorite question, which is, will it do ISIS? 
Uh, I believe I asked, I asked between here. Uh, where where OSPF2 is supported. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and OSPF v3 will be supported as well okay. for IPv6. Excellent. Yeah. So that's coming. Um, so that's what we can do to peer. Yeah. Of course, you still need to configure this router as you would today. The APIC's not going to configure that for you. Uh, but you can choose one of those <coughs> protocols uh, to run between this leaf. And ideally, this is dual homed, right? I'm, I drew one router to keep it simple so we don't take up too much whiteboard space. Uh, but ideally, that would be dual home to a it's, couple of it's leads. It's dual home, but so from the external router's perspective, is it seeing that fabric as one device, or has it got multiple peerings to it? What's going on there? Good. So it's going to be just with peering neighbor relationship with the guy it's connected to. <clears throat> and actually, what's happening in the fabric, we run our own set of protocols, right? Tested for our topology, the spine leaf that you don't tune or mess with. So the fabric is running things like VXLAN, ISIS, and then if you're doing external layer 3 connectivity, what happens is you can run whatever you want here, but anything that's coming into the fabric gets redistributed, and we use MPBGP. That's all uh, abstracted away from me. You know, I mean, yes. but from, from that external perspective, I'm just effectively yeah. peering with one device, really. Yes. Yeah, we'll just see this leaf, which we call a border leaf sometimes, as a neighbor from that guy. Uh, now, can I destroy this beautiful picture a little bit? <laughs> no. <laughs> if I have the connection from the router to the other leaf, so I'm dual homed into mm -hmm. ACI fabric, mm -hmm. will that be one or two routing adjacencies? So if we're going to two different devices, that's going to be two different adjacencies. And I guess you also don't recommend running four channel over those two links. You could. So you can, because you can do uh, either physical layer three interface, sub interface, um, or SVI routing. Mm -hmm. So you could, yeah, you could make it a port channel. That would be fine. By M lag between the leaves, so. Yeah, you do M lag between the leaves, right? Do what? Multi chassis between link aggregation. So one port channel PPC. from the router PPC. side. PPC. Yeah, yes. host, yeah. Host, yeah. Can I, host can either be, so it's a layer three fabric fundamentally, right? So host can either be dual layer three attached, like routers, or they can be layer two attached with a VPC like yeah, connection. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, VPC, we can still do VPC. I, again, I've just drawn one connection for simplicity's sake here, but let me go ahead and ruin my picture. No. <laughs> that, oh. I can still oh, that, do. That was him, not me. <laughs> I can still do VPCs. <laughs> I can still do uh, virtual port channels. So, uh, from the routing perspective, it looks like your fabric is the MPLS VPN cloud and the router is the CE router. Essentially, yeah. We can kind of think of this as, as one big router. Everything sort of right. something else again. Yeah, and anything, so that one of the, at least one of the spines will act as a route reflector, so we don't have to have a full mesh BGP topology. So MPBGP is what the fabric uses. And then, of course, anything coming out <coughs> will redistribute into whatever protocol we're running on that link. Mm. I have to open this can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine you have a different router sitting somewhere else connected to the same fabric and you're using OSPF from that router to the fabric to this router. Will the internal routes on intra-area routes on that part appear as intra-area or inter-area routes on this part? So the fabric was not designed to be a transit network but there's enough request for that, that that's coming. Mm -hmm. um, right now, uh, any routes, um, any subnets that you've marked as public are the ones that get advertised out. But right now, if I had another router here, any routes that I'd learned from this guy, we're not gonna advertise out to that other router. Okay. We don't wanna be a transit network. Look, fair. It's coming. Mm -hmm. There's enough, I mean, lots of people do that, and that's a common request, but. Right now, we're only adverti advertising the Fabrica uh, public subnets. Yep. 
All right, so that is how we set up the domain. So it doesn't matter if it's VMware, we can do this cool integration. It could be bare metal servers, Minecraft servers, Hyper-V, right? whatever we have out there, that's the key. It doesn't, doesn't matter. We have a way to connect it to the fabric. We have a way to put it into endpoint groups.